Ready for your weekly mental gymnastics class? <clears throat> okay, you ready? All right, please join with me. Let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. And we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are. For we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together, all of our relationships to one another, to him. And we pray that his holiest spirit be upon us, lifting us above and beyond all regions of sorrow, limitation, and fear to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is. Together, we all say, amen. amen. I'd like to begin this evening <clears throat> reading from Lesson 292 in the workbook of A Course in Miracles. The lesson is, a happy outcome to all things is sure. A happy outcome to all things is sure. God's promises make no exceptions. And he guarantees that only joy can be the final outcome found for everything. Yet it is up to us when this is reached. How long we let an alien will appear to be opposing his. And while we think this will is real, we will not find the end he has appointed as the outcome of all problems we perceive all trials we see, and every situation that we meet. Yet is the ending certain, for God's will is done in earth and heaven. We will seek and we will find according to his will, which guarantees that our will is done. We thank you, God, for your guarantee of only happy outcomes in the end. Help us not interfere, and so delay the happy endings you have promised us for every problem that we can perceive, for every trial we think we still must meet. A happy outcome to all things is sure. Now, I want to talk to you tonight. Notice the word guarantee is used at least twice here. He guarantees that only joy can be the final outcome. We thank you, Father, for your guarantee of only happy outcomes. You know, life is complicated, but truth is not. A Course in Miracles says complexity is of the ego. And when we try to filter our understanding of our life experiences just through the mortal story, we can get caught in the circumstances. They're like a web of confusion and complexity that actually is the, the forest we can't see through the trees. And the Course in Miracles says that we have undisciplined minds and that we have so many problems because we are too tolerant of mind wandering. We always wander back to the human story. Who did what? Who did this or that? What we did wrong, what we did right. So when you know spiritual principle, which is not complicated, but which is actually very simple, it empowers you within a complicated world. Because you perceive, you extend your perception beyond the complexity to the underlying patterns. And when you understand the underlying patterns for what they are, then instead of being always at the effect of the circumstances, you, you become a master. You become at cause in your own circumstances because you don't let them tempt you to think that something is more important than it actually is. Your power in this world lies in knowing 
You are not of this world. The part of your mind that only identifies with the world as that the physical eyes perceive is a disempowered mind. And it leads you to think of yourself as weak and circumstances as strong. When you identify with yourself as spirit, because the Course in Miracles says you are heir to the laws that rule within the world you identify with. When you identify yourself as spirit, then you begin to align yourself with the spiritual principles, which mean is the same thing as saying with the power of your own mind. To align yourself with spiritual principle is the same thing as saying to align yourself and use the power of your own mind. The world of the human story or circumstance is the realm of effect. The, your mind, the human consciousness, is the realm of cause. So when you are working only with trying to change circumstances, you are trying to change the effect. And if you only change the effect in a situation, then even though you might make some temporary change, it will always come right back like a like, uh, like a rubber band that will just come right back. Because unless you change things on the level of cause, the effect will continue to reflect the cause that was originally there. When you do align yourself with spiritual principle, that means, number one, you remember who you are. Number two, you remember why you're here. You are empowered in any situation to the extent to which you remember who you are and you remember why you're here. You are disempowered in any situation when you forget who you are and you forget why you're here. The ego mind says that you are a body, that you are separate from other people. The ego mind says that you were born and then you will die. The ego mind says that you were just a little basically speck of dust surrounded by a huge universe over which you have no control. That is not who you are, but to the extent to which you think it is who you are, you are living in a state of primal forgetfulness and an existential hysteria beyond which you can even imagine. If you can imagine the, the absolute upset of a little, little baby when it's just t t torn out of its, its mother's arms or its father's arms and the baby starts screaming and yelling, imagine that and multiply it by many, many, many millions of times and you begin to have a slight sense of how you feel at the deepest level, whether you are conscious of it or not, from having been cast out of your deeper experience of dwelling safely in the arms of God. Now, when we do recognize, recognize who we really are, then we know we are one with God, we are one with the universe, we are one with each other. We realize that is our identity, our oneness includes our identity of love, and we know that why we're here. We are here to give love. The law of cause and effect, the Course in Miracles says, was set up for our protection. I keep myself in love, then love is what I will get back. The Course in Miracles says you were not created to be at the effect of lovelessness either in yourself or in others. When we, however, do move into that state of primal forgetfulness. That is the metaphysical meaning of the exile, Adam and Eve exiled from the garden. You step out of the matrix of loving thought. You are cast into a mental construct where randomness and chaos and confusion and anxiety and despair are inevitable. Buddha spoke of two states of being, suffering and happiness. Once again, complexity of the world. The Course in Miracles, very simple. There are only two emotions. Love, which is the truth of who you are. You have a mind. What is the difference between mind and spirit? Spirit is the loving mind. It is the truth of who you are. When you use your mind for non-loving, i.e. non-spiritual purposes, you are misusing your mind and repudiating your selfhood. Now, if I am in a state of love, the Course in Miracles says, happiness is the natural outcome. If we use our mind in a loveless way, the Course in Miracles says fear sets in. The Course describes two fundamental emotions, love and fear.
When I'm not using my mind for the purposes of love, I move into a state of fear. And all negative emotion, the Course in Miracles says, derives from fear. But just as when you turn on the light, darkness is no more, because darkness actually doesn't exist except as the absence of light, when you bring forth love, fear dissolves because it actually had no existence except as the absence of love. In the presence of light, darkness cannot exist. In the presence of love, fear cannot exist. Now, the mind of fear, which is simply the belief, the false belief in our separation, our separation from God and our separation from each other, which is evidenced by the physical senses, because my physical senses tell me you're over there and I'm over here. My physical senses tell me I am a body separate from the rest of the universe. But the physical senses are not the mental filter that God created. They are an illusionary filter. They lead to a conclusion about your identity and your relationship to the rest of the world that is false and also leads you in a state of desperate loneliness and sense of existential isolation because you feel that you're over here and everybody else is over there. The ego mind, which is this belief in separation, is the repudiation of love. It is the spirit of fear. It goes by many different names. The Course in Miracles uses the word ego. This ego or repudiation of self leads us to thoughts, tempts us into thoughts that are loveless in order to perpetuate itself. In order to perpetuate itself. It resists forgiveness. It resists love. It, forg it, it resists mercy. It resists compassion in very sly and insidious ways because its power is the power of your own mind turned against you. It does this in order to perpetuate its own life because in a moment of total forgiveness, it is dissolved. And that is why sometimes you feel like you'll die if you forgive. You'll die if you just love. And that is because the ego mind, which is posing as your true self, would in fact die. The ego mind seeks repudiation of you. Think in terms of alcoholism or drug addiction. They are not just here to inconvenience you. Their goal is to kill you. And addiction, substance uh, abuse, addiction such as alcohol or drug addiction, is an example. It is one form that the addictive mind takes. But at the deepest level, the point is not alcohol. At the deepest level, the point is not drugs. At the deepest level, the point is the activity of the addictive mind. The ego is the addictive mind, the constant pull toward the loveless thought, the self-destructive thought. The ego mind in all its forms wishes not just to inconvenience you, but to kill you. The Course in Miracles says the ego mind is suspicious at best, and it is vicious at worst. And all we have to do is look at the state of the world. All we have to do is look at the state of the world. You step back and you go, this is insane what we are doing. It is insane, the level of, of violence. It is insane, all these nuclear bombs. It is insane what we are doing to the Earth, and the Course in Miracles would agree with you. We cannot, however, be as effective as we would like to be as contributors to a collective wave of healing on the Earth until and unless we become adept at applying these principles in our own individual lives. Now, the ego mind, metaphysically, one term for the pattern of repudiation of love in yourself and others that is the ego's goal, one word that describes the energy pattern by which fear seeks to obliterate love, by which guilt seeks to obliterate a sense of innocence, by which forces of death seek to obliterate the forces of life. One word is crucifixion. 
The ego mind seeks to crucify you. The ego mind seeks to destroy you. And it doesn't need simply to attract other people and situations by which other people will do you in. It is even deeper and more insidious than that. It seeks to create and to burrow into your consciousness patterns of thought and behavior by which you will do yourself in. And those aspects of your consciousness where the ego has burrowed in and come up with ways to get you to attack yourself by your own thinking and your own behavior before anybody else even has a chance to is called in modern parlance your character defects. Now your character defects are not where you are bad. It's much deeper than that. It's where you are wounded. It's where somehow the darkness, it was enough of a split psychically that the darkness got in. The ego said, ooh, I can use that. So the character defect, that one of the fascinations that the ego has is, ooh, where did it come from? But sometimes the ego's fascination with discovering where it came from is just a delay technique. It's a delay tactic to keep you from owning it and surrendering it to be healed. Because if you get too mesmerized by where it came from, it becomes all too convenient to blame mommy or to blame daddy or to blame whatever the social or whatever condition is, which the ego just loves, because as long as I am casting the blame, displacing responsibility onto someone or something else, then that makes it sure, that, that ensures that I will not actually put the character defect where it needs to be put in order to be healed, and that is into the hands of God. The character defect might be that you're needy, it might be that you're controlling, it might be that you're selfish, it might be that you're angry, it might be that you're arrogant, it might be that you're prideful, it might be whatever it is. But it is first and foremost in existence not to mess with other people, but to mess with you. Because by your succumbing, to the behavioral impulse, which is promoted by the character defect, you are more likely to sabotage and to undermine your own experience, ruin your own relationships, and tempt other people to behave towards you in the same kind of way you behave towards them, or at least in reaction to the ways that you behave towards them. The Course in Miracles says you cannot bring light to the darkness. You must bring the darkness to the light. You bring the darkness to the light, which is why in something like Alcoholics Anonymous, for instance, you have to admit the exact nature of your wrongs. It's why Catholics confess. It's why the holiest day of the year in Judaism is the day of Yom Kippur or the atonement. You admit it. That which you are blind to, you do not deal with. So when we ask God to heal us, sometimes it feels like things get worse rather than better. They don't actually get worse. It's just that often we are anesthetized to the way we are messing our own lives up. So if I say, dear God, heal me, then the answer comes in the form of a magnifying glass that is put onto my own character defect. And he says in The Course in Miracles, I cannot take from you what you will not release to me. So stuff has to come up in a kind of detox process. So situations occur in which we are very likely to feel ashamed of ourselves. Very likely to feel guilt, very likely to feel self-hatred, very likely to feel remorse. And remember, remorse is not in and of itself a bad thing. Only sociopaths have no remorse. Only sociopaths have no conscience. This is why so much of the story with, with my latest book, uh, Tears to Triumph, and the conversation we've been having is, is about how it's so important for us not to avoid the sad times. Because sometimes the sad times are where we're having to look at things that are painful to look at. Yes, that's why they're sad. The poet Rilke, I, I quote at the very beginning of the book, a poem by Rilke where he says, let me not squander the hour of my pain. You don't want to distance yourself 
from memories and situations like, oh, how, how could I have done that? You know, I know in my own life I have felt sometimes like I was just, like the wind just threw me against so many rocks. I was just thrown against so many rocks in various situations, professional and personal. And I remember the time when it became really clear to me I was the wind. That nobody has messed with me the way I've messed with myself. And even the ways that other people have messed with me to actually look at the ways I set them up to do that. No one has ever been my enemy as I have been my enemy. And once you see that and you see how sly and insidious the ego is and what, what, what was operative there, was operative there was you were acting from the character defect. Now, as I said before, the character defect is not where you're bad. The character defect, by definition, is where you were wounded. But you're not a child anymore. Children are victims, adults are not. So it doesn't matter where you got it, it's yours now. And healing is not found in the past, the Course in Miracles says, healing is found in the present. And so that which we put on the altar is altered. The altar is in the mind. The outer altar is a reflection, of a symbol for the inner altar. You give it up. What does it mean to give something up to God? God is not outside us. The Course says one day you will realize nothing is outside you because reality with a capital R is a quantum field beyond time and space. There is no outside you. So you're talking, everything is actually inside you, including God. So when you're talking about giving something up to God, we're not talking about abdicating responsibility. That's what it means to take responsibility, because you are putting it that it might be lifted to your higher mind. The lower mind, which is the mind of fear, dominates this planet and has for millions of years in time as we know it. Enlightenment, the Course in Miracles says, is the unlearning of the mindset of fear that dominates the planet and the acceptance instead of the mind of, of love, which is the spirit, which is the truth of who you are. In any moment that I'm thinking with love and acting with love, I am aligning myself with an ordered universe. God did not create a disordered universe. God created an ordered universe. Anytime I'm using my mind in a way that deviates from love, I am casting myself into a disordered universe. Universe of chaos, randomness, confusion. I don't really understand who I am. I don't know why I'm here. I don't, am I connected to something bigger than myself? Or am I, what's my relationship to the universe? What's my relationship to the earth? What's my relationship to you? Uh, can I get something from you? Whereas when I remember that I am love, it's can I give something to you? Once you realize that every thought you think creates an effect, that which I give to you, I'm giving to myself. There's a line not in the Course in Miracles, but it's a traditional line, virtue is its own reward. You come from a loving place because ultimately you'll feel better at the end of the day if you did. Right? Whereas, if I use my mind in relationship with you in a non-loving way, the Course in Miracles says that is an attack thought. That which is not love is fear. Mind is powerful, the Course says. All thought creates form on some level. So if I'm not using my mind to create, I am using my mind to destroy. The Course in Miracles completely obliterates what I call the myth of neutrality. The myth of neutrality is where both of us live, most of us live. Well, I don't really go around, you know, trying to help people and serve people and have mercy towards people and have compassion for people, but I mean, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Sorry. All thought creates form on some level. In the world as, as we have it, in our political situation, if we are not proactively, generation after generation, cultivating love, cultivating peace, cultivating justice, cultivating brotherhood, there's nothing to be surprised about when all of a sudden forces of hate just seem to emerge. You don't fill the room with light, darkness will set in. And that is true whether it is your own mind or the larger culture and planet on which you live. Now, as we begin to realize the power of the mind then, if I am not loving you, then I am 
opening myself, I am making myself vulnerable to the machinations of the ego mind. The ego mind has a cornerstone thought. The cornerstone thought of the ego's thought system, The Course in Miracles, is that the Son of God is guilty. And it is like a scavenger dog, the Course says, always looking like a heat-seeking missile, a scavenger dog for any scrap of my brother's guilt, any scrap of evidence that it's your fault, your fault. You're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. You should be different. You're guilty for this. The ego mind doesn't want me to monitor my own character defects, but it is vigilant about monitoring yours, right? Because it doesn't want, it doesn't want to die. And it is kept alive by loveless thinking because my loveless thinking is what it is. And as long as I'm judging you, blaming you, attacking you, defending against you, I'm feeding it. The Course in Miracles says, anytime I am thinking without love towards you, imagine, the Course says, all attack thought, imagine a sword that is falling over your head, but be very clear, there is no time and space. It's not falling on yours, it's falling on mine. That's why the golden rule is perfect. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Why? Because they will. Or if they don't, because they've, they've got it together and they've figured this out, somebody else will. Or if everybody around is an enlightened master and nobody does, it won't even matter. You'll still feel like they did. Time, the Course in Miracles says, is just a learning device. So it will seem to take time before I get my, you know, instant karma, but it's actually instant. It will come back. It will come back in time. But in fact, I planted that sword in myself in that moment. The cornerstone thought in the spirit's thought system is that the son of God is innocent. So just as the ego mind is always on the lookout for someone else's guilt, the spirit within us is always on the lookout for someone's innocence. But I will not find someone's innocence only on the level of behavior because we all make mistakes and we are all wounded. So to the extent to which I live my life within the circumstances and basing my sense of reality and my sense of importance and everything that's going on within the realm of the mortal circumstance, I will suffer because I don't always get it right and other people don't always get it right. The Course in Miracles, one of my favorite lines in the Course is where it says, God will outwit your self-hatred. Your character defects are the living embodiment of the expression of your own self-hatred. The ego mind, as I said before, it's not really out to ruin other people's lives. They have their own ego. It's out to ruin your life. So if you look at something like alcoholism or drug addiction, definitely you see how its tentacles would seek to bring down the entire family. But the one it really has a bullseye on is you, right? So your character defect is the ego's kingdom. It's the dark kingdom. Now, the universe, one of the things we talk about, is when I say that the universe is both self-organizing, i.e. the ordered universe, and self-correcting. The only thing that can disorder the universe, although it cannot actually disorder the universe, because what God created and how God created it is eternal and changeless. So when I'm thinking loveless thoughts, I'm actually not thinking, I'm hallucinating. This is why in the Course, as well as Einstein, as well as Buddha, it's called illusion. And I'm cast out of the garden into the outer kingdoms of darkness or chaos, randomness, illusion. Now, we are not left there. One of the things I talk about in the book, this is, this is my book has all this in it, actually, because this particular issue of human suffering that is produced by the loveless mind. Buddha said... Life is suffering. This is a sec I think it's a second noble truth. Life is suffering, meaning this planet, being at the behest and at the effect of and basically slave to, the thinking of the world does cause suffering because it is loveless. That is the primary light of Buddha's teaching. The primary light of Judaism is that God does not leave us to suffer. So the story of the Exodus is that when the Israelites were suffering as slaves in Egypt, God sends Moses to deliver them. 
And then Joshua is told in the, during the journey in the desert, do not be terrified, God said. I go with you wherever you go. This is one of the basic principles in the Course in Miracles. God goes with you wherever you go because God is in your mind. So Moses is one metaphysical representative of the idea that no matter how lost in the illusion, usually the illusion being on some level, at least indirectly, a product of your own character defect, because even if it was somebody else's issue, you probably had some character defect there that made you vulnerable to even being in relationship with that person or in this circumstance, but you are not left alone. God delivers you. Then the light of Jesus, who then suffered on the cross, notice in all the great religious teachings, all the great spiritual and religious teachings, heartbreak and human suffering and despair are foundational. This is not something just recently discovered by the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> this is something that is basic to the human condition when it is lived out of the circle of love, right? The mind of Jesus, Jesus suffers on the cross. So the mind of Jesus is the idea that in the midst of our suffering, i.e. in the midst of the crucifixion, i.e. in the midst of the pain that it causes, the mind of Christ within us is such that the, the effects of our suffering are nullified. So whether it's Buddha or, 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 or Buddhism or, or Judaism or Christianity or Course in Miracles or uh, Islam or Hinduism, all the great religious and spiritual systems speak almost kaleidoscopically. They're different facets of one great diamond of truth, which is spoken in many different ways. And it's spoken not only in religious or spiritual terms, it's also spoken in secular terms when you talk about something like the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, and so forth. The point is, when, when, when Buddha said that life is suffering, when the Israelites were suffering under the dictates of the Pharaoh, that's what the Pharaoh is, the inner slave driver. The inner slave driver, that's what the Pharaoh represents. Or Jesus is suffering on the cross. That's not the end of the story. That's really the beginning of the story. Because once Buddha realizes life is suffering, this begins his journey to enlightenment wherein he receives the eightfold, noble eightfold path. The Moses telling the Israelites, telling Pharaoh, let my people go. God sent by Moses. Once again, God will outwit your self-hatred. Let them go. God does not leave the Israelites, his children, to suffer as slaves. He has a plan. And with Jesus, of course. So you have the, the, the suffering that is the realization of Buddha. Then he struggles with the, with the demons of illusion. And this ultimately culminates in his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree or the state of nirvana. In the story of the Exodus, Moses is sent to deliver the Israelites. Finally, after much negotiation, the, the Pharaoh says, okay, get out of here, get out of here. Moses says, we gotta go, we gotta go quick. As we all know, they don't even have time to bake the bread, the matzah, and so forth. That begins the 40-year journey through the, through the desert that then culminates in entrance into the Promised Land. Jesus suffers on the cross this is then the beginning of the alchemical mystery by which three days later the resurrection occurs. So the 40 days of, of Buddha, the 40 years of the Israelites, and the three days between the crucifixion and the resurrection all symbolize the time it takes to get this stuff right. The time it takes where we're living in the midst of our own mortal circumstances that cause us to suffer, we change our mind. We follow the Eightfold Path, which is, there are different aspects to it, but it's basically living a more impeccable life. Same with the, with the Ten Commandments. You know, when God comes to save you, he doesn't say, oh, just do whatever you want. It's like when Jesus in the New Testament says, go and sin no more. He's saying, I've healed you. I've delivered this shakti, my consciousness in yours. But don't go thinking the way you thought before, because if you go and think the way you thought before, the symptom will return. Right? So whether you're talking about, so in, in that, God has, with the Israelites, of course, it's the Ten Commandments, and with, 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 with the message of Christ, love one another. Because if you don't love one another, crucifixion's going to come right back. 
I mean, that's all that's happening on this planet. Every problem we have on this planet is because lack of reverence. Why do you think we have environmental, environmental <clears throat> degradation, desecration? Because we have been irreverent towards the earth. We are irreverent towards each other. Why do we have global poverty? And when you look at global poverty and how much that is at, at, at one of the core foundational reasons for global terrorism, because we haven't had reverence. How do you let children, how do you let 12,000 children starve every day? And what are you thinking that you don't think this is going to lead to problems down the road when you have millions upon millions upon millions of people so desperate. Desperate people should be seen as a national security risk. They become, large groups of desperate people become more vulnerable to ideological capture by psychotic forces. Once you know these principles, once you know them, you know them, and you look at so much that's wrong in the world, and you think, what were we thinking? But whether you are talking about the spiritual culmination as enlightenment, nirvana, the promised land, resurrection, self-actualization, mental health, or inner peace. It's all the same thing. It's the mind to which we are evolving and to which we, into which we must evolve or these problems will continue. Once again, God will outwit your self-hatred. We have free will, the Course in Miracles says. And what that means is we can think whatever we want to think, but whatever we think will have an effect. So your character defects <clears throat> are the primary, it's the dark kingdom within you. It's where the ego knows that it's got you. It's got your subconscious wires crossed. Before you even knew it, before you even thought about it, you just said the neediest thing. You said the most selfish thing. You said the most controlling thing. You said the most arrogant thing. You said the most angry thing. Whatever it is that just makes people go, no. Right? And then there went the relationship, there went the job, there went the whatever. Now, when things go wrong in your life, the ego doesn't want you to say, where were my character defects involved there? The ego wants to talk about how other people are to blame for this. Other people are to blame for this. And for the cor in the Course in Miracles, it says, only what you are not giving can be lacking in any situation. That's why, we are, we are, they, that's why they say in AA about taking a fearless moral inventory. What was your part? And you might say, well, 90% of it was their stuff. Fine, but what 10% of it was yours? And then when we see, you know, some people, a lot of times I hear people say things like, well, I know I'm, I'm working on this. I got to work this out. Careful with that when the ego loves for you to think it's something you just have to work out. Because it, once again, it's a delay tactic. It's a delay tactic. It's going to take me a while to work this out. Well, in time, it will take you a, way, a, a, a time to work it out, but it won't. If your attitude is you're working it out, you'll never work it out. The attitude is, dear God, please take this from me. Please remove this from me. Now, how does that work? If you, let's say your issue is jealousy. And you know that you ruin relationships over and over and over again because you behave in a jealous way. You've gotten to the point where you know this. You know that it's a character defect. You might have even gotten to the point that you know it was because daddy ran out on mom all the time and that's why I'm that way. Well, you probably already know if this is your issue that just knowing that it was because of daddy and mommy has not ended it. <clears throat> right? And so, you have gotten to the point of realizing, regardless where it came from, it is ruining your life now that you have internalized this behavior. So you say, dear God, take this from me. Once again, as I said earlier, when you ask God to remove a character defect, what starts to happen is that the spirit, what the Course calls the Holy Spirit, it's as though it takes a, a magnifying glass onto that behavior on your part. Once again, you'll then think, oh my God, things are getting worse. No, they were this bad before. <laughs> right? But you were so anesthetized because you were going around thinking it was about other people. And how could he talk to her? He knows I have this issue. Right? <laughs> so, all of a sudden, you will become very clear. And this will be a difficult time. This is why this whole topic of knowing sad days are not necessarily the bad days. Difficult emotions are not necessarily the wrong emotions because when you're healing, you're gonna, it's gonna be, it, this stuff comes up. It's just like if you're going to physically detox, it's not gonna feel good for a few days. Right? That's why this whole let's numb it, let's distract it, let's the pharmaceuticals, let's see it as a disorder. 
There's nothing wrong with you that this transformation is occurring and the stuff is coming up. This is what's right with you, right? So what will happen is you will realize your jealousy, you've known that your jealousy is a character defect, and the story goes something along this line. You will go to a party and you will realize that your jealous behavior has caused problems before. Your boyfriend, your husband doesn't like it, that you walk into the party and you cling to his arm, and if any woman even looks at him, you, you have a problem, you have a hissy fit, at least in your feeling, even if it's just a look on your face which makes him feel like he's imprisoned by you, which he is, <laughs> right? So you know, I really need to change this behavior. So that's the first step. You know, in AA, they say you can think yourself into a new way of acting more easily than you can act yourself into a new way of thinking. So part of the journey at the beginning is you know you have this character defect, and you realize, I have this wound, but I don't have to act from this wound. So you completely outgrow lines like, well, this is just the way I am. Enjoy your loneliness. Right? So you go, OK, I, I have this wound. I do not have to act from this wound. So you at least fake it till you make it. You at least adopt the behavior. And so you say, it could be a man, it could be a woman, obviously, but let's say it's a man, and you say to him, go enjoy yourself, have a good time, I'm fine. And you're dying inside, it doesn't matter you're dying inside, you're <laughs> acting correctly. And this is a big deal. The ego says, whatever you feel is right. The ego is big on that one. If you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at the Eightfold Noble Path, we have lost that in this society. That some things you do because they're the right thing to do. And the fact that you didn't feel it at the time is so irrelevant. Right? We have this idea, well, if it's how I feel. Well, it might be how you feel, it might be your appetite. But I assure you, it's not your deepest desire to blow it like this. Right? So, interesting things will happen, like once you just take the step, because remember, God supports you. God sends Moses. God will outwit your self-hatred. So you're leaning into the solution. You're leaning into trying to be your best self. You're leaning into trying to dwell in that state of consciousness, call it Christ or any other, whereby the effects of your suffering will be nullified. And so things will happen, like, okay, you've sent your boyfriend or your husband to go have a good time, and you'll see him in a few minutes, and you're sitting there, and you my God, I'm, oh my God, there's so many gorgeous women here, and I bet they're going to talk to him, and he might talk to them, or whatever. And then this couple will walk through the door. And it's like the entire universe has become a passion play for your sake, because that's how much God loves you. And you're going to see what, let's say it's a woman, it could be anything. Let's say, not anything, there aren't that many options, but it could be a woman. <laughs> And how a woman who was not wounded in childhood the way you were acts. And she too tells the guy, go on, honey, have a good time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be over there with some people. But you can tell she wasn't just faking it. That's what it looks like when somebody is aligned and is not wounded in that area. And you notice that because she has no emotional backing to this releasing of him, he actually comes back various off, pretty often just to give her a drink, ask if she's okay, give her a little kiss and say, okay, you okay? I want you to meet somebody or whatever. And so the entire universe supports you in healing because you have leaned into healing. And at first it's like a suit of clothes that you know you're supposed to wear but it doesn't really fit you yet. But you still wear those those clothes. It's like in the Eightfold Path when it talks about right speech, right livelihood. When it says right speech, it means do not spread negative gossip and do not criticize people and do not speak negatively. Well, you still feel like it. But the fact that you feel like it, it's, it's like going to the gym, physical exercise. You discipline your, ex, your, your physical muscles and you discipline your attitudinal muscles. You discipline your behavioral muscles. Finally, that woman, through a series, and it's a process, she will go from being totally jealous and acting out of her character defect, acting out of it, she will then become someone who has changed her behavior, but inside she's still dying, but she's exercising her muscles and she's disciplining herself. And there are probably going to be three or four times that she gets it wrong, but the effort itself is meaningful. And by the way, he probably sees that she's making the effort. She continues to make the effort. Situations will continue to occur. Well, she will get to practice. 
Finally, she will, her, the atonement, which means the correction of perception, the evolution of her consciousness will be such that she will actually be healed of this wound. Now remember, in the, in the New Testament, after the crucified body is put in the tomb, and three days later the women come to claim the body, they are told by the angels, it is not here, he has risen. Now this is fascinating. The jealous you, the old you, it is not here. You have risen. It was never the real you. It was an imposter self. It was a face of personality that was created out of the wound. But it was never the real you. It was always an imposter. So it's not just that you've gotten better. You have changed. Renew your mind. This is what makes it a religious process. And this is why someone like Carl Jung talks about religion and psychology. The Course in Miracles says religion and psychotherapy at their peak are the same thing. So that finally this woman's in a new relationship and the man says to her, you know what I just love about you? And she'll say, what, honey? He'll say, you're just not like jealous the way some women are. And you're thinking, oh, sweetie, if you only knew. <laughs> he doesn't have to know. That was then and this is now. Hallelujah, praise God, you have been healed, you have risen. And that's what personal transformation is. Now, everything that's gone wrong in this world, not only in your world, in your personal life, but everything on the planet that has gone wrong, the universe is on it. The universe is on it. It's very easy to look at the state of our world today and despair. It's very easy to just say, well, I can't even imagine how this is going to get fixed. I, I can't even imagine how this, between global terrorism and environmental degradation and the, what's happening in the American political system, it is very easy to go into this belief that the ego will get the final word. The ego will not get the final word. A happy outcome to all things is sure. I once heard it said, it's not over till the happy part, and if it's not the happy part yet, it's not over. This is also stated in The Course in Miracles with the first sentence, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. The human race, the self-hatred of the human race, and that is what the ego mind is, the insane mind, God will outwit it. This is just the beginning. This is a time of great reckoning. This is a time of kind of collective bottoming out. It is. It is a time when the whole human race is saying, you're gonna continue like this? Because as the Course in Miracles says, there is a limit beyond which the Son of God cannot miscreate. What does that mean? You do this long enough, you'll die. You continue drinking like this, you'll die. You continue using drugs like this at a certain point, chances are you'll die. The planet continues to behave so irresponsibly, the human race behaves so irresponsibly towards the earth and towards each other. The word unsustainable is not ugly enough. It means it's not going to go on forever like this. But if we remember what the great religious stories are, they explain to us that success is guaranteed. And that's why in the section that I read tonight, the only question is how long it takes. The human race is going to get it right. We're going to learn to love each other. We're going to put love before money. We're going to make the primary Organizing principle of our civilizations, of our economies, of our societies, of our governmental and business functioning, love rather than money. What's up to us? How long it takes for us to wise up and do that. And that time will be measured in human suffering. We're going to get it right. The only question is how much suffering is going to occur before we decide to do that. And as you and I face the character defects in our own selves, face the crucifixions in our own lives, and experience the humility that results when we heal, and the gratitude for life that results when we heal, and the miracles that occur in our lives, when we take the darkness within ourselves and we say, God, you take it, I, am, I, am, I want to be, you know, to be a servant of God is the same thing as saying you want to be a channel of love. Not just sometimes. The Course in Miracles says your problem is not that you do not believe in love. The problem is that you do not believe in love only. Everybody here, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be watching this tonight if this love conversation didn't attract you. 
That's not the problem that anybody has in this room. It's not that you're not like already, yeah, the love thing is real. The problem is that we all have that one area or two or five where the ego still, he's in charge of that room of your house. And it could be your anger, it could be your controlling nature, it could be your critical nature, it could be your neediness, it could be your jealousy, it could be your lack of impeccability and ethics, and whatever it is, you know what it is. The issue is, it's time now. The Course in Miracles says you're not perfect or you would not have been born, but it is your mission to become perfect here. And the ego mind wants you to think that's arrogant. The ego mind thinks it's, it's humble on your part to say, well, I'll never be like Buddha, I'll never be like Moses, I'll never be like Jesus. But it's actually very humble for you to say, that's where I'm headed. The Course in Miracles says about Jesus himself that he is in a state that is only potential in us. He has actualized the light in us, but he says in the Course in Miracles, I don't have anything you don't have. The only difference is I don't have anything else. It's time for us to spend less time coddling our weaknesses and more time claiming our strengths. And everybody talks these days about how you have to own your shadow. Absolutely, we have to own it, to see it, to, to give it up for surrender. But we also need to own our light. Because when I own my light, that means that I am claiming the level of consciousness in which my darkness will dissolve, and yes, it will come up first. And yes, that will be painful, but that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And that's why we want to be so clear about this issue of that's not a disorder in you. That's not a problem. Your exquisitely sensitive nervous system is not your weakness, it is your strength. So when people say, you know, somebody said to me early in my career, oh, this stuff you teach, is it's just you're teaching an easy way to cope. I said, this shit ain't easy. <laughs> it's a lot of things, but it's not easy. It is moving into deep, deep layers of our resistances to love. Things that have been there since we were little, little children that we're not even conscious of. Things that have been in the culture for millennia. But what's going on right now is that we are having to face, you know, it's like this whole thing of what's going on in the world today. Yes, it's disturbing. These are very disturbing times. And it is appropriate to feel disturbed when times are disturbing. These are times that try men's souls and that try women's souls too. But we can dwell within this darkness. We can dwell within this period of crucifixion. We can dwell within this slavery to the dictates of the Pharaoh. We can dwell within the realization that life of suffering, as long as we keep our eyes on the journey ahead, and we know that in God, in God, as we contextualize all of this spiritually, knowing that this is simply here so that I can burn through this and I can move to the other side of this and I become the person that God will have me be and then being healed of my own defects, I will be able to play at a higher and higher level with other people who are similarly healed and together we are going to form a a wave, a collective wave of healing, whereby even in this 11th hour, God will show his hand. God cannot do for us what he cannot do through us. So it's not like God outside us is going to come part the waters, but God within us. When our minds are as surrendered to God as Moses is what surrendered to God, then any miracle that needs to happen will happen. And absolutely, absolutely the waters will part. And absolutely... The, the water will turn into wine. And absolutely any miracle that needs to take will take place because we will, once we have entered into that consciousness of love in which so much of that darkness has dissolved, we will be presence of the alternative. We will be miracle workers. We will be people in whose presence things just happen. Breakthroughs occur. You will be sent, as God said to the Israelites, you will become a nation of religious, of holy leaders. That is what you will be. And in your work, whether you're a scientist or you're an artist or a business person or whatever you do, you'll just become a shining example of something there. And you will have charisma that not everybody in the room has. And everybody will notice you and recognize you. And they're wondering where you got that. But those who already have it will know exactly where you got that. And those who have that similar look in your eyes, the Course says, they will, they will be attracted to you and you will be attracted to them. And those who don't yet have that look in their eyes, but they see that twinkle in yours, will wonder where you got it. And the Course in Miracles says at that point, you will not be alone, for mighty companions will join you. 
and you will feel that you are part of this great revolution of love. You will feel that you are part of this great miraculous healing of the world. And we will live to see the day when this terrible, terrible reckoning and this terrible, terrible sense of urgency and crisis has begun to dissolve. And even if you don't live to see the day when, the, and when everything is somehow miraculously healed, it won't even matter. Because once you have embarked upon the great revolutionary effort to turn these things around, to work the miracle that needs to be worked on this planet, it won't even matter if you see all of the results before you die. You'll die so happy because you will know that But before you left, what do we say here? You kicked ass. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our dear friend Adam Isidore is back from your vacation, your travels. <clears throat> All right, so in our meditation this evening, uh, it, we say here often, really listen to yourself uh, on these nights. Whenever you're in a room in, uh, where people are talking about God, people are talking about spiritual principle, really listen to yourself. You know, my daughter and I were having a conversation the other day about times that she's experienced in her life and I've experienced in mine where it wasn't that I didn't know the answer, it's that I didn't act on what I knew. You know those things when you go, I, I knew better than to do that. I, something in me did know. Sometimes we say, well, I don't know what to do. Sometimes you, act, you know exactly what to do, you just don't like what it is you know you need to do. Well, I don't know what God is saying. Sometimes you're very clear what God is saying, you just don't like what God is saying. And we're just not in the mental habit of seeking with the answers within. So the issue is not just to seek the answer, but then to act on the answer. And because everything else, as I said, is a delay tactic. So when we go into these meditative places, and you ask the Spirit of God, the voice for God, to speak to you and show you, take it seriously. So tonight we're going to go into those places of the character defect. And you know, it's kind of interesting because sometimes you might see something or hear something that isn't even what you expected to see or hear. You might be thinking, oh, I'm really going to think about this particular part of my personality, and then you feel something come up within you and go, well, actually, remember what you said to so-and-so the other day? And you go, yeah, and that part of your mind will go, is that really the way you want to play that? Because you still might be at a point of not even admitting yet and owning yet, your ego might be slyly still in such a place of justification that you don't even see yet that that's your own darkness. Does that make sense? So whatever it is, it's all the answers, everything that you need to see will be shown you. My only message is allow it to be shown. Okay? Let's take a deep breath and close our eyes. Dear God, we place ourselves in your hands, all that we have and all that we are. And we consciously and willingly open our minds and open our hearts. And we pray that your spirit come upon us and travel through the various byways of our mind. Take from us, dear God, what does not belong there. There are defects, there are areas of our personality where we know we're not radiant points of light. And in these areas where we know what it is we do, we know the neurotic pattern, we know what games we play, enough people have told us we place them, dear God, in your hands. And allow yourself to see the words. Allow yourself to hear the message. This is just between you and God. What word or words describe you at your weakest? 
at your most loveless? Are you arrogant? Are you prideful? Are you judgmental? Are you critical? Are you negative? Are you defensive? What is it that you think? What is it that you do that works as a barrier to keep love at bay? that serves as a wall between you and others, between you and intimate relationship, between you and social and professional and financial success. Do not be ashamed to look at it. It's not where you're bad, it's where you're wounded. But allow the wound to be shown to the divine physician. that he might heal it with his love. Seek to forgive the mother, the father, the teachers, the whomever, whose own behavior infected you, for they were probably infected themselves. Look with mercy upon them and mercy upon yourself. For you have suffered at the effect of your own craziness for so long. However much you might have hurt others is almost nothing compared to how much you have hurt yourself. And in your heart atone, admit, own it, and pray, dear God, release me from these chains that bind me. this aspect of my personality. Disentangle the wires that got crossed so deep within my mind so long ago. Soften, dear God, my harsh edges. Make me strong, dear God, where I am weak. Make me rich where I am poor. Make me plentiful and abundant where I lack. Pour forth your light that I might be the man, that I might be the woman, that you would have me be. that binds me 
to unhealthy substance, to unhealthy relationship, to unhealthy activity. These dark forces that have injected themselves into deep, deep places in my psyche. Dear God, I know I am powerless before them. Send forth your spirit that I might be delivered, that I might be released, and that I might be free. And thus, as I rise up from the tomb of my crucified self, I shall evolve. I shall enter the promised land of my own true being, the resurrected state of my healed and holy mind, the nirvana, nirvana of the joy and happiness and peace it feels to arrive And may my homecoming, dear God, be of use, freeing not only me, but others. May I be used by you. May I be a conduit and a channel for your love, a worker of the miracles you have worked within me. be saved from the torments of the fearful self. Feel the peace of God upon you. Thank you, Adam. Okay. I have a couple of questions uh, from live stream that I did want to take. Okay. A question for live stream. Romantic relationships. How can you tell the difference between only what you are not giving can be lacking in any situation? That is a line I often quote from The Course in Miracles. How can you tell the difference between only what you are not giving can be lacking and a line that, that I wrote in my book, A Return to Love, that quite a few people seem to have memorized. If the train doesn't stop at your station, it's not your train. <clears throat> so this woman is asking, how can you tell the difference between only what you are not giving can be lacking and if the train isn't stopping at your station? You know what? Sometimes what you're not giving is permission for them to just leave if they need to leave. Okay, that was fun. <laughs> okay. I'm a 30-year-old woman <clears throat> who has never been in a serious relationship. I've had a couple of flings, but nothing close to serious. I desire so badly to find someone. I've prayed about it, meditated, read books, etc., and yet I have not met him. Well, let me just stop right there. Sometimes it's not that you didn't meet him, it's that you blew it with him. So just be very clear. Sometimes this whole, I never met him, I never met him, I never met him. Many times in life, we, we want to be honest with ourselves, both personally and professionally. It's not that we never had the chance, it's that we blew the chance. And that's, that's one of the important things. You might have met him a few times. Just a little honesty that helps you on your path after you. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is where it gets 
something we have to talk about. All right, I've lost my faith in God. I prayed, okay, out of anger and hopelessness, I slept with a coworker who is married and has a beautiful two-year-old girl. I know what we did was bad, but I don't feel any guilt or regret, and that's what scares me. I feel like with losing faith, I have become emotionally numb, not just this situation, but in other areas of my life. I need a miracle. I don't want to give up on spirituality and behave in ways that are not morally right, but I want to feel again. Please say a prayer for me because I can't seem to do it by myself. Well, first of all, I want to say to the, to the woman who wrote this, when you say, I don't want to give up and spirit, spiritually and behave in ways that are not morally right, but I want to feel again. The only way you could do what you did, as you said before, was to become emotionally numb. So be, holding on to spiritual principle is the way to feel again. Um, and I, listen, I so don't say this from a, from a high horse. I've lived a long life already, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not someone who's always gotten it right, but we do need to be very clear. You don't sleep with a married man with a beautiful two-year-old little girl because you don't have to, you know, it's like you've probably told yourself, well, I mean, I don't wish his wife any ill. Um, that's not enough. It's just not enough. Um, uh, they, if they have an open relationship, that's different. If their agreement is an open relationship, it, I doubt that that's what their agreement is. So when I said before, if you wrong someone else, you're wronging yourself. Um, we don't have enough, um, we don't have enough, as I said earlier, um, we have become a far too lenient society with ourselves. Um, if a woman has a two-year-old baby and she's married, she's already got some stress, I assure you. And she's already, by definition, got stuff going on. And the last thing she needs is other women sexually prowling around. And it's a feminist issue and everything else. So I just think we, you know, sometimes in life, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's, it, and that's what we, lack, and that's what the ego would have us let. The ego would say, but I want, but I want. But once again, you start messing with other people's feelings, once again, you transgress against others, it's going to be yours. So I think we have to be uh, honest with ourselves. Once again, I don't say that. I don't think it, this is not about any of us being in judgment with anyone else, and it, it, with anybody else, certainly not me, but it is something for us to be clear about. And that's why when Buddha talks about the Eightfold Path or Moses and the deliverance of the, uh, the Ten Commandments, when you ask God to take you out of your suffering, he, he tells you the ways to live so that you don't suffer anymore. Okay? All right, but much love to you, Maureen. And uh, there's some guy out there, and uh, he's just, uh, it's not even that he's waiting for you. He's already there. He's not married. Okay? All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about anything you want to talk about. All right, raise your hand. Hi, I'm gonna to go to people first who, who haven't, that I haven't heard from, and then we'll come, come back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, did you not have your hand up? It was an illusion. Okay, uh, anybody here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, my question is also about relationships. I am newly dating someone, and I feel insane. I'm sorry, you're saying you're newly dating someone yeah. and you're feeling insane. Yes. Okay, well, so far you're normal. Okay. Uh, so one of my things is that I, I think the thought that comes is that it's over. I'm so sorry, what about it? He, he leaves and my first thought is it's over. Okay, hold on just a moment. Okay. How long have you been dating this person? Like two and a half months. Two and a half months. What do you mean he leaves and you think like it's he, over? He leaves my apartment or we, you know... I've been there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so lately he's, well, the last week he's sort of been um, unreliable. And I'm wondering if it's my thoughts about it being over that is sort of making him, you know, that he feels that. And then I'm also doing A Course in Miracles, the workbook. And there's some, like I've been sort of thinking, or the one that is, my thought about this is meaningless. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a week later that says, I'm not alone in experiencing the effects of That's my right. thought. That's right. Good point. Well, you're, you're really doing the work, so I want to acknowledge you for that. 
But then I, I'm going, like, I just feel okay. like I'm going deeper inside of my head. Okay, well, let's deconstruct this a little bit. First of all, two months is usually when reality, you know, they say it's when, you know, the, the modern psychotherapeutic mythology around this is that two months is when reality begins to set in. From a spiritual perspective, it's when the illusion begins to set in. Okay? So, um, your every time he leaves acting like it's the end, yeah. men don't like that. Right. You know, it's, uh, it, 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 this whole, we've talked before about how men are hormonally programmed to not want to give a woman something that he feels she's demanding of him. And this freedom thing, they have this freedom thing. It's, it's, it's millions of years of evolution have gone into this. Millions of years of evolution have gone into our wanting to just kind of nest here, and millions of, evolution, uh, of years of evolution into, have gone into their wanting to leave for the next one. So to some extent, the personality trait, not the sexual acting out of it, but the personality trait needs to be respected in them and in us. And the freedom, it is a healthy male thing, not an unhealthy male thing. But he's that, broken plans. Pardon, but thing. no, we're okay. taking, I said, let's deconstruct it, we're gonna take one at a time. So the first thing is that, that issue of your behaving needy when he yes. leaves and getting off a clint and all that kind of stuff, not cool. Right. Now, the second thing, you said he's now behaving in an unreliable way. Right. Is he behaving in an unreliable way or is he behaving in a way you don't want him to act? Um, both. Well, can you give us an example? Well, so there's been like plans last week where he's sort of called and been like, oh, I can't make it anymore. Or like text, you know, can't do it anymore. There's been a few times where he just hasn't shown up where he said he was going to. I mean, he's told me about it, but he, he didn't like just not show up, but. Okay. And then so he disappeared over the weekend, no tech, no nothing. And I'm. Okay. So that's information. Right. That's information. So as soon as your mind goes into he's being unreliable, you are getting out of clarity because that's a judgment. What he's being is not, as inter not acting as interested. Right. So one of two things, two basic categories is happening. He either isn't as interested or he's going into his cave, right. which is kind of he's on time for that. But what you want to avoid is something like he is unreliable. So your ego mind wants to start judging him mm -hmm. for the way he's behaving, which will actually keep you bound to that behavior and put you emotionally at the effect of that behavior. And in that place of being emotionally at the effect of the behavior, you will be, you will be actually hurting yourself right. and making yourself less attractive. So you want to be attractive, whether it's for him to come back to or for, you to, for him to see how cool you are even when you accept it and move on. So don't take yourself out of your power. Just pray and, a and ask. Constantly put this on the altar. Put the relationship on the altar. You realize that this is bringing up all your craziness and all your stuff for healing. The Course in Miracles says that the special relationship is the biggest gun in the ego's arsenal. This idea that this one person will make it right. We all have that. And the Course in Miracles says that the transformation spiritually is from what the Course calls the, whole, the, spirit, the special relationship to the holy relationship. His stuff is coming up. Right. His stuff is coming up, but so is yours. Here's a little avoidance stuff, your little right. addictive stuff. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the human race. Mm -hmm. right? right? But if you see it that way, stay on your own side of the street. Dear God, may I, I release this person, I release him. May he be blessed, may he be happy, may he be loved. Make all of your prayer every morning that he be happy today, because your ego wants it to be, will he text today, will he call today, will I see him this weekend? Your spirit is, dear God, may he be blessed today. I definitely, may, he, no, may he be happy today, and it's really, it's, it's working just like when you go to the gym, you're working against gravity. Well, spiritually, you're working against emotional gravity, right? Because your ego wants to make it all about you. And when it's all about you, you're out of your power because you're out of you. You're in, the Course in Miracles says, do not look to yourself to find yourself because that is not where you are.
So just, dear God, may he be happy. Dear God, may he be happy. Dear God, may he be happy. Dear God, may he be blessed. And what this does, it's, it's like alchemy. It, it, it is an alchemy. It's a brain alchemy. And it will deliver you to your clarity and your coolness. And you're just going to let him be where he needs to be. And from that place... You are detached. You are not negatively attached. That's what Buddha calls the grasping mind. You are now in the grasping mind. It's not just that he didn't text. It's that you need him to text. Right? So I don't know whether this man is having a natural cave thing or whether he, he's walking out the door. That's not for me to know. But I know as the Course in Miracles says, you think you have many different problems. There's only one, and that is your separation from God. I know that your deliverance lies in your achieving a state of consciousness where, number one, you will be able to discern which it is. Number two, you will be able to discern your own divine right action. And number three, you will not suffer. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. And then I see you also. Yes. <clears throat> Carly. I'm going to stay on this topic, if you don't mind. Okay. You want to stand up if it's yeah. comfortable for you? Um, so thanks for bringing that up. I feel like I screwed up with the guy I've been dating for two and a half months. <laughs> you feel you screwed up with him, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Let, okay. So... I, <laughs> I had a talk with him. He lives in London right now. Uh-huh. And uh, plans to move back in the fall. Okay. Um, he's come to visit a few times. And I said to him, I've been really, like, it's clear to me that I need someone who's, I, I think it's, communication is really important to me, and that's becoming clearer than it was before. Okay. <clears throat> but I said to him, um, I really need you to meet me halfway here, and I need you to text me every day. Oh, Kylie. I know. <laughs> even it made me even walk I away. Know. <laughs> so, of course, it's like not happening, and I'm like, well, see. And well, what? And I'm like, well, see, that's, yeah, because you're not, you know, because then my ego goes into, well, you, you're not lovable, and everybody leaves, so. So, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the words you said. You said he. I, I'm just going into like, well, look, he's not texting, so... That is healthy on his part, by the way. Mm -hmm. the health, the, a healthy man would not go, okay. Yeah. He would not be in his healthy masculine if he did that just because you asked him to. Yeah. So do I owe him an apology or do I just bless him and release him? <laughs> or, or do you just what? <laughs> Bless him and release him constantly. Well, in your mind, you know when people say, when do I release a man? Every morning. <laughs> right? <clears throat> I mean, that's this, this whole, we want to release people that we love. Yeah. You release your children, you release everyone to be who they need to be. You want to be a space whereby people can find their own strength and magnificence. So you want to be a space of becoming. What your behavior is to be now, I, it's not for me to know. But for you to atone and to get, like, first of all, I want you to meet me halfway is about as sexy a comment. I mean, what is this? We, if people treat, treat romantic relationships like business negotiations these days. Yeah. We've demystified it. We've taken all the feminine... Did, did you take my Aphrodite training? Yeah. You, well, what, go look at it again. My, my male therapist you, advised me to do this. Uh, your what? My, my male therapist. I should probably for forgive him for that, too. Your male therapist, first of all, there are a lot of female therapists who would have said it, too, that you should say to him, meet me halfway. And, well, once again, because the Aphrodite training certainly wouldn't have. The Aphrodite training is, the, is about the veils, the, the mysterious veils of the feminine. That's transactional, and that's what's happened to relationships in our society, not just romantic ones. It, it, there are more transactions than relationships. So... For you to get and to live with what that was, and also it, it bespeaks such lack of self, um, sense of your own self-worth that you wouldn't just assume that this guy can't help, he can't stay away. It actually says you can, please don't, right? So I think you need to sit with a lot of that right now. And it's okay because as you atone, all minds are joined. So as you atone, 
and get that, he will get on some level that you got that. Now, what he does with that, I can't know. And what behavior you're to go to, I can't know. But the principle is for you to really get that that was a self, it was, it was not very kind to yourself. Or to him. Or, well, to him, I mean, he can handle it, obviously. <laughs> um, but yes, it was not owning your feminine power. The, the, the masculine within us is dynamic. The feminine in us is magnetic. Uh, you know, it's like telling a man what to do. It just doesn't work with a healthy man. And it shouldn't work with a healthy man. If it does work with a man, it means he's not a healthy male. Mm -hmm. Right? And so sometimes, you know, their behavior will, will show you. And then it's like I said to the other lady, it's information. Mm -hmm. But then if you've had sex, then that's why casual sex is so dangerous. Because once you've had sex with a person, you know, it's like that whole, all that brain stuff that they now know. You know, if once a man has entered any orifice, it could be your ear. <laughs> no, I'm serious. A tongue in an ear, it could, a, a kiss is a bad. All that's a, the, the woman's chemicals. And once again, there's millions of years of evolution supporting this. And that's why it's such a lack of self-care. Because once the chemicals are involved, it's very difficult not to be grasping. And so if a man has not proven and said that he wishes to be in that level of, of, of commitment on some level, communication and so forth, then having sex with him is, is a lack of self-care on your part. Because the ego will say, well, if I have sex with him, they'll bring us closer. But we're all grown-ups here. It doesn't work that way, except for about 15, 20 minutes maybe, <laughs> right? 30 minutes, an hour, or whatever. The point is that if, it, if sex is a substitute rather than a deepening of communication, and so, once again, you're suffering. You're suffering. Does that make sense? That's okay, Carly. Just in your own mind, atone for it. Go through this with God. It's going it's, it's to feel, feel funky. You feel stupid. You feel humiliated. It's all part of the process. And you grow from that. Does that make sense? Okay, coming over there. <clears throat> Uh, okay, I'm going to go, th this lady has her hand up, I'll do that before and go over there. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Marianne, it's a pleasure Hi. being here in your presence. I don't know how to begin. Um, I have two siblings. My mom passed away three years ago. She had cancer. <coughs> I was her caregiver. And since then, my sister and I, our relationship, just, there is no relationship. There's a lot of resentment, bitterness, a lot of past hurts. And I've tried to, not tried, I think I have forgiven her, but she hasn't forgiven me. And as a result of that, I don't have a relationship with my nieces. And it hurts, because I'm not in their lives as much as I would like to be. And my sister, is, she plays the victim. So I, she's not approachable, I can't express my feelings to her, I tried. She gets very defensive. Got it. So I feel blocked. Okay. And stuck. Okay. Because I still have my father. Right. He's still in good health. And what? He's in good health, thank God. But right. he wants us to be a union. Right. And unfortunately. Okay. So I guess my question to you is how do you deal with a situation or someone right. who's so blocked right. spiritually? Okay. What is your name? Millie. 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 And you're Carly, and what is, you, what is your name? Dana. Dana, okay. What do Carly and Dana and Millie all need? A miracle. There is no order of difficulty in miracles. And what we were reading tonight was a happy outcome to all things is sure. So you start from that. You start from knowing that in the mind of God, Dana's situation is perfected and they're totally at peace with each other. We can't know whether they're supposed to be together or not. Spirit, spiritual healing is on the level of content, not form. So we don't know. We, but we know that they're both at peace with each other. Same with Carly. Happy outcome to all things is sure. They're, hap they're happy. They're at peace with each other. With Millie. What is the miracle? Outcome to all things is the happiness is, is guaranteed. Remember the word. We, we're guaranteed between Millie and her sister. So you start from that. 
and you remember what the Corps says, that the only real problem, whether it's Dana's situation or Millie's situation or Carly's situation, is separation from God. Now, sometimes it's your own separation from God, i.e. love. Sometimes it's somebody else's separation from love. But the Course says you were not created to be the effect of lovelessness, either yourself or anyone else's. So you lay claim to the world beyond this one. And that's what we started with tonight. We started with this notion that the ego mind makes it about the circumstances. The ego mind makes it about who said what. But the level of, of truth and reality with a capital R lies beyond who said what. The truth of the matter is, on a level of spirit, Dana loves this man and he loves her. On the level of spirit, Carly loves that man and he loves her. On the level of spirit, Millie loves her sister and she loves her. Now, we are all assigned. The Course in Miracles says all relationships are assignments made by the Holy Spirit where we are assigned to people in relationship with whom there is maximal soul growth opportunity. So this is where Dana's rough edges are rubbing up against his rough edges, Carly's rough edges are rubbing up against his rough edges, and Millie's rough edges are rubbing up against her sister's rough edges. So first thing you do, only what I am not giving, you atone for your own mistake, and you look deeply. Your ego mind wants to make it about the guy. Once again, he's not being reliable, right? But we want to look at our own stuff. Secondly, Millie, where are you? You're the human, the human experience is the tip of the iceberg. Who said what? On the level of that which is above the waterline, she's closed. So on the personality level, you can't send an email or have a conversation because she's closed. So you have to go into the soul level. Pray for her happiness five minutes every day. Pray for her happiness. And what we're going to do is we're going to say a prayer with all these women, and I'm sure that there are other people in this room and other people watching <clears throat> who also have relationships that you would like healed. And you need a miracle, and you ask for that miracle. And then, Millie, after that, you know, like I said, it's not my job to know. God's not going to tell me what Millie should do. But the principle is you will return to the principle and go deep enough into the principle of just praying that she be happy, praying that she be loved, blessing her. Every, all the, everything will be lifted. And because her mind is one with your mind, all minds are joined. That's a large part of this. All minds are joined. So when your perception is corrected, i.e., when you have accepted the atonement, the other person feels it whether consciously or not. Does that make sense? So you need a miracle, and let's pray for that. And same with Carly, and same with Dana. So I'm sure that, uh, uh, is yours a relationship miracle also? Okay, so let's do the relationship miracle prayer, and then uh, we will move on to the next thing. Does this at least intellectually make sense to everyone? Okay, good, okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, we join with Millie in placing the relationship with her sister in your hands. We join with Dana in placing in your hands her new relationship. And we join with Carly in placing in your hands a relationship with the gentleman in London. All of us now place in God's hands the relationship with anyone with whom things are disturbed, disjointed, and painful for us or for them. And we pray that these relationships be lifted to the level of divine right order. May they be lifted above and beyond all walls that separate us. May a great wave of forgiveness come upon us all, Millie and her sister, Dana and that man, Carly and that man, all of us, and the man or the woman with whom there is the disturbance of the heart. May a great wave of forgiveness come upon us, and may we see only the innocence in ourselves and in each other. And may the universe between us thus be corrected. As we see only the innocence in each other and in ourselves, God himself now paves a new path forward 
we release the other person, praying only for their happiness, praying that they be blessed, praying only that we be a space of goodness and blessing in their lives. We bless them if they choose to come towards us. We bless them if they choose to walk away. But we ask only that our minds be conduits for the love, the infinite mercy and compassion of God in their lives and in the life of every human and every living thing. And thus may miracles heal and correct our hearts, our lives, and our relationships. And so it is together. We all say, Amen. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to thank you um, for this evening, for this lecture. It's my first time here. Thank you. I'm actually looking to get your book. I haven't gotten your book yet. Thank you. Uh, my question is um, in regards to religion and spirituality. So I, I grew up in a religious um, background. Um, I grew up as a Protestant. And uh, I went through a situation in my life where I actually needed more than what was being taught um, at church. And I actually went back, spoke to the pastor, and I had some very specific questions because I felt that what I was going through, I needed something way above. Like I needed something because it was just totally taking over me, right? And the situation was that I um, violated, sorry, I'm French, I violated my own value, right? And I was questioning just the entire belief system, right? So from religion to spirituality, what's right, what's wrong? And the reason for that is because, I guess it is someone relationship. I was seeing somebody that values were not there at all. However, from a spiritual perspective, I was able to connect with that person's soul, right? And it was a great, great, great person. You know what I mean? Like, again, uh, the person was a great person, but the values were just totally messed up, right? And I sort of got caught up in this. Um, and I know you mentioned something that there is such thing as social path, right? So if we all, if we are all love, if we all have God in us, like how, how can you differ whether or not somebody is a social path and there's no such thing as, I didn't know there was such, no such thing as somebody with no conscience, but if we're all God, how, is there such okay. a thing? I, I think I do understand. So, you know, uh, sometimes people talk about the chakra system and that has to do with the centers of power and energy. And sometimes it's kind of like when we were talking about sex with these other ladies. You can love someone, but make sure it's, if their values are not correct, for instance, it shouldn't have anything to do with your lower chakras, right? So you can love everyone, but that doesn't mean that you become involved in certain ways with everyone. A lot of times you'll say, well, he's just damaged. Well, yeah, that's right, but damaged people sometimes damage people. And the fact that everyone is an innocent child of God doesn't mean that everyone has values or everyone has ethics or whatever. So there's nothing spiritual about wandering into, an, an, you know, it's like if you're a totally, totally, totally enlightened master, I guess go anywhere in Central Park night or day. But if you're not, then you don't go into the park at night after a certain time in certain places, right? So there's nothing spiritual about opening every aspect of your life to everyone just because he or she is an innocent child of God. And the Holy Spirit gives you that discernment. It is true that the Holy Spirit would not have you close your heart to anyone, but that's very different than behavioral manifestation. And my heart might be open to you, but I'm clear you're using heroin. Therefore, you don't get my keys. That doesn't mean I'm withholding love from you. I'm just withholding my keys from you. Does that answer that question? So sometimes someone is in our lives. It seems that the lesson in life sometimes is to know that I can see this type of person and walk to the other side of, of the street. And let me see if I have this one right, because I talk about this in the Woman's Worth. Um, at a certain point, you see a snake on the other side of the road, and oh, no, you see a snake and you cross the road to be with the snake. 
because you don't even realize it's a snake. Then in the, in the next part of the journey, you realize it's a snake, but you still cross the road. The third part of the, um, of, uh, the, the, the journey is, that's a snake, I keep walking. And so sometimes that's why we meet certain people or we go through certain situations to know I can bless that person and I don't have to linger. And in order, and I, I'm one of those, well, one of the teaching that I've actually, um, from Kabbalah that I was used to, to teach was that um, you attract, you know, um, who you are. And that's why I sort of, I don't know, it was very confusing. It was a very confusing part of my life. And is there such a thing? So I guess you just, I guess, somewhat answered the questions. Um, somebody, I, I don't know if she's here or not. She knows who she is. She may or may not be here. We were talking the other night, and there was a situation where a man uh, came forth with a certain offering um, that was lower level than should be. And she accepted the offering anyway, low level behaviorally. And she made a point about, but I guess I attracted that into my life. No, free will was involved there. The fact that it was attracted into your life, you still have a choice whether you say yes or no. So sometimes when we say, I attracted that into my life, it's a very sly and insidious way of abdicating responsibility. You know, I met him. I didn't have to give him my number. And one of the things that I've learned in my life, and I think any of us, once we've experienced enough, know, people pretty much show you everything in the first 15 minutes. They do. And they, this is one of those, you didn't believe what you knew. You know, Pat Allen, the psychologist in Southern California who I respect so much, she talks about how, <clears throat> she said men don't actually like to lie until the woman has proven that they're not safe to tell the truth. And a lot of times between men and women, the man told you, I'm not in it for a relationship. The man told you, I don't want anything serious. But you're slyly thinking, well, he just hasn't had me yet and all that stuff. <laughs> and there's so much where it was exactly what he said. Either he said it and you didn't listen, didn't take it seriously, or he said things that you should have listened to. And didn't take yourself, uh, treat yourself with enough care. I mean, if someone says to you, certain things and then you make yourself available to vulnerability which is contradictory to what you were told then later you realize the issue was your own lack of the 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 the, pos the, the real legitimate meaning of self-care does that make sense so to say that that we were something came into our lives because there is um because it's a, a lesson to be learned yeah but sometimes the lesson to be learned is that i will not be doing this again Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. My name is Grace, and my question is, I have been experiencing a situation for the past 10 years with my living environment. Uh, uh, I've been changing. I lost my home, my last home, and since then, what happened in my last home has been happening every place I go. Violation, people are entering my environment and I can't seem to find any privacy or comfort where I live to the point where I'm moving to almost homelessness. I'm always like on the brink of homelessness. No matter how I've prayed and tried to think positive, the next place I get to, I encounter the same situation. And I listen to you, and I accept that I have to, it's, my mind is, I finally accept, I should say, that you it's my, what, accept, the, accept that it is my you. mind that I'm creating <clears throat> um, that situation, but I want to know what I can do to clear it up, because it's been going on very long, and it's affecting me mentally. My kids think... I need psychiatric help. My son took me uh, about five years ago. I was immediately given medication, which I didn't take, take because I always felt it was a spiritual situation and not a mental situation. My son is coming back again. My kids have actually moved away because they're tired of dealing 
with the same scenario over and what over What do your again. children say is the reason this is happening? And um, please put the mic closer to your mouth. Yes. Why do your children, what is their view of why this is happening? Um, they say, I am creating the situation, that it's something with me and not every place I go. And what, do they tell you what that is? No. <laughs> when we did the prayer tonight, I mean, the earlier the meditation and the character defects, mm -hmm. did you hear anything about yourself? Mm -hmm. Do you think that any of the things that you heard in the meditation and were looking at in the meditation have anything to do with this? Yeah, during the meditation, there was one person who I had been blaming all along, who is my eldest sister. And I acknowledge that even before I came here, that I have to stop looking that someone else is doing this. Okay. I acknowledge that. Um, I have been saying my prayers and praying for her, along with my yes. other siblings. Um, but I am ready to be released right. from so this situation. So in these situation. situations where you keep going through the same thing over and over again, as you know, the one common denominator is you. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to ask God to identify for you is what aspect of your personality, this is not blaming the, de the victim here, mm -hmm. but some piece, dear God, what, it's not just that I was there, what was there in my behavior or in my decision making? Is it that my decision making was unwise, that that's even where I moved in, much like we were talking about just now. Sometimes that's what it's about, that we went somewhere we see in retrospect, why did I go there? or it might be something in our own personality or in our own behavior. And that is what we want to ask God to free us from. What is the aspect of myself that I keep bringing to bear on my life circumstances that, cause this, that, that somehow sabotages this for me over and over? Now, I don't, want you put, uh, to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but does anything come to your mind? That, that would speak to what I'm saying. I've been questioning myself and examining myself over the years, um, admittingly not right away, uh, over Just the 10-year period. Question. But Is there anything in your own behavior that you can see as being common in all of these situations? Except for me, right now, I can't think of it. I can't see anything. All right, well, we're yet. going to pray that that be shown you. Yeah. Because he says in the Course, it is not your job to seek for love, but to seek your barriers against its coming. Perfection, the universe is, is created to serve you. So everything that would contribute to your happiness and your well-being, the Course in Miracles says, is already on the way. <clears throat> and uh, we were talking to the, the young woman who said she's 30, she's never had a relationship. It's not even that it's, it's coming, it's already here, it's already been here. The issue is where are my walls? that have kept me from being able to experience the good that the universe has sent to me. It's like we were talking about before, about all the opportunities that we've blown. This is the work. So sometimes we don't know. We don't know what it is that we do. And that's why we were talking about earlier tonight when the Holy Spirit puts a magnifying glass, and it's very painful. And it, it, it becomes something very dramatic where it is impossible for you not to know. And the reason I asked about your children is because one of the things we talk about here is if you don't know what your issues are, your best friends can probably tell you. Right? And that's why I asked, what would your children say? I know I have a child and, you know, she, she you know, something about our children can see, see into us as we can see into them. But sometimes they're the ones who can lay it down in ways that you might not hear it from someone else or whatever. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to pray for, Grace, is that God show you what it is that you're not seeing. That's what God does for us. He opens our eyes. He opens the inner eye. He opens the inner ear. He opens the mind. He opens the heart. Because until you see it, you know, everybody's stuck at this, well, I know I created this. Well, good luck with that one. To me, that just makes me feel more upset because I don't know where to go with that. And what I want to know is what part of me, what, 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 what am I doing? What, what are my thoughts? You know, I went into a, I had a situation where I really blew it. I really blew it. And I later looked at the fact, you know, I always say my life works really well when I practice what I preach. And 
You know, we say here all the time, before you go into the meeting, send love. Send love to everybody you know is going to be there. Send love to everybody you don't know is going to be there. Uh, pray only to be a vessel of love. And you know, not only did I do that, I actually later remembered actually saying to the woman next to me who was a friend, God, I hate these kinds of meetings. I actually said that to her. Well, all minds are joined. My negativity was read by other people in the room. That's how powerful your mind is. Right? So that's what we want, that's what we become adept at is seeing. It doesn't mean that we're never going to make mistakes, but we do become pretty good. We, what we stop doing as spiritual seekers is pretending like it was somebody else. What was my part? What was my part? And in my, in my situation, it was you walked in with negativity and that other person, and you both just met each other at that place. Right? Does that make sense? So let's pray with grace. And as we pray with grace, which I think needs to be our final prayer tonight, we're, we're doing with grace what we are doing with her in all of our lives, in that place where something isn't working. Like Grace said, she's no longer blaming her older sister, only what you are not giving. Because even if somebody else's behavior was involved, which it probably was, you know, I'm, very few relationships are all one person or the other. I'm sure other people had their issues. The point is you were not created to be at the effect of that issue. So another person's transgression against you can only continually hurt you until you forgive them. You take the hook out of them, the hook is out of you. Does that make sense? So atoning for our own mistakes and forgiving other people for theirs. And then grace will be shown. You can't, the Course in Miracles says, the Holy Spirit will respond fully to your slightest invitation. But we have to be willing to face. And that's where we get all this, this conversation in this book and all that that's become so big. Everybody's running away from the icky feelings. And you can see from everything we're talking about to really face what you need to face to change, it's not going to feel happy for a few minutes. Does that make sense? But then, but you have a choice. You can either take the sharp pain of self-discovery or live in this space of dull ache that will never go away. And then once you get it, you become, you become almost eager like, tell me what I'm doing. Tell me what I'm doing. I want to know what I'm doing wrong. You, you, once you realize this is how it works, you say to those closest to you, tell me. I, I need somebody to tell me. And also, what I've seen is not all the time, because like the one I just mentioned to you, I was really, I couldn't believe I had made such an elementary mistake, right? But there have been other times in my life where I didn't want to look at what I was doing wrong because I thought if it was true that I was doing that, I would hate myself so much, and I didn't want to face that. And I remember once when I'm realizing, once I did face it, I thought, wow, I must have really had to have been hurt at some point to have developed that as a coping mechanism. And I actually, instead of feeling self-hate, I had some compassion for myself that I didn't even expect. So we're also afraid to look in, because it's icky in there. But it's not dangerous. What's dangerous is not looking in. And that's really what tonight is about in the character of your face. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to pray, for, uh, pray with grace real quickly, because you had your hand up, real quickly. Yes. Uh, Microphone? Somebody? <coughs> Thanks, Jonathan. My question is kind of related to Grace's. I find that I'm constantly in the same problems with racism in my career. I keep coming up against it over and over again. Did you say racism? Yes, and I want to know how we deal with that because what's my part in that if I send in my resume, people hire me over the phone, I arrive and they go, oh, you're overqualified once they see me. I don't know what my part in that is. I'm trying to find that. And so why are you assuming, why are you concluding that it's a racial issue? Oh, uh, because people are telling me. Like the person that will well, refer people, me. Well, that's illegal. They can't be telling you that. No, no, the person that will refer me say, will say to me, the only thing I didn't tell them is that you're black. And so I don't know how to deal with that in terms of me dealing with that. Like, what's my part in that? Well, for, wait a minute. 
So first of all, in a situation where somebody, you showed up for the job, they said, I'm not hiring you because of your black. No, they, they make excuses. They'll say, oh, you're so overqualified for this. We'll call you or whatever. But that's then, why I was saying, why are you concluding that it's a racial issue? Because the person that referred me will then say, that's the only thing I didn't tell them. And this is like in the film industry where you name your successor. Everybody names their successor. If you're leaving a film, you then say, this person's taking the job over for me. But so. when you said your friend, did your friend actually hear it from the person that it was because of your race? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it happens a lot. I mean, I'm not, it's happened to me, but it's happened to a lot of other people. So I want to know how we deal with that as, as a community. Like, when racist things happen to <laughs> us, how do we then say, okay, that's on us or... It's not you know, something I'm well, giving. Well, nothing's on you, but, you know, I'm Jewish. And I think being Jewish, being African-American, being many things, it's like anti-Semitism exists. It just does. Racism exists. It just does. But you were not created by God to be at the effect of anti-Semitism. You were not created by God to be at the effect of racism. So there are people who are Jews who are at the effect of anti-Semitism, and there are people who are Jews who are not at the effect of anti-Semitism, and same with racial. Now, I'm not in any way here saying that victims of the Holocaust were, were responsible or that Trayvon Martin was responsible. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying there are not situations. However, in terms of our own living as we move through our lives, we want to pray to be lifted above even that, that level of thinking. Because the more you identify yourself, I remember saying early in my search, it was like, well, how enlightened can a Jewish woman from Texas be? And the answer I got, to the extent to which you think of yourself as a woman, think of yourself as a Jew, or think of yourself as a Texan, not very. Because enlightenment is by definition where your primary sense of identity is lifted above any of those labels. The real you is neither black nor white. The real you is neither male nor female. The real you is not, is, is, is not any of the physical manifestations. That is not to say that the physical manifestations do not matter within this world or that they should not be honored because they should. And it is not to say that we do not want to live in honor of our incarnation. I think that if you are born as an African-American, you're born as a woman, you're born a Jew, you're born whatever, I think that part of your karmic assignment is to be a light unto that system and to be responsible to your ancestors and to your descendants and all of that. That's very profound. But we find that place of honor by first identifying the deeper truth, which is I am in my essence none of those things. And when I am in my essence none of those things, then I can dwell within those things with greater dignity and power. Does that make sense? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> oh, thank you, honey. And we are beginning tonight, as we enter into a state of prayer, we pray with grace. And we are told to pray for what we need within worldly terms. And so we join dear God with grace. She needs a home. She needs a place to dwell. And we join with her, dear God, in praying that you remove any obstruction to her landing in the perfect place in which for her to live, whether that obstruction is within or without. May it be removed. And for all of us, the same is true, whether it's professional or personal, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whatever it is. Whatever stands in the way, dear God, of our receiving all that you wish for us, we are willing. We pray that your spirit enter into us at the deepest level and open our eyes that we might see and open our ears that we might hear. That we might be lifted to the place of wisdom to atone for our own errors, to forgive other people for theirs that these situations might be miraculously reborn. We pray for Grace and we pray for Michael, for Beverly, for Melanie, and for Maureen, for Bogoslawa, for Jordana, for Alec, for David, 
for Noah and for Mason. All of us now deliver into God's hands our problems, our burdens as we perceive them. We place in, our, in God's hands any questions that need to be answered, any decisions that we need to make. We place in, our hand, in God's hands our lovers and our friends, our spouses, our children, our parents, our siblings. We place in God's hands this political season. We place in our hands God's hands, our nations, and our precious world. We place ourselves in service to God. Dear God, please use us. Use our hands, use our feet, use our minds, use our behavior. Flow through us that we ourselves might be the vessels of love you created us to be. And now go forth in confidence and go forth in faith. For there are angels to your left and there are angels to your right. There are angels in front of you and angels behind you. There are angels above you and angels below. Wherever you go, God goes with you, for God is within your mind. And he has already created a path of light before you. With each step, remain in this light. And if ever you are confused or anxious, think of yourself as a small child and put out your hand for an elder brother to take, to guide you, along the path to peace and to love. This is no idle fantasy. He is here. And so it is, with love to each other and to all the world, we say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you so much.